On this week's show, we'll be discussing if Star Wars Outlaws is worth the Republic credits, has Concord truly failed before even taking off, and the full Nintendo Direct breakdown, all that and much, much more on this week's Gamer Guild podcast. <laughs> Good game, everyone, and welcome back to the Gamer Guild podcast, your weekly show where we round up all the week's video game stories and news for your listening or viewing pleasure right here on youtube.com forward slash Gamer Guild TV and up there in the digital cloud on your podcast preference of choice. Your podcast players for this week are none other than myself and Mr. Chris. Happy birthday, Chris. Oh, it is, I guess, when it goes live. Yeah, thank you. I'm the ripe old age of, I'm oh, sorry, I've leveled up to leveled level up. 30, 35 today. Don't feel a day over 34 at the time of recording. <laughs> at the time of recording, you are totally not a day over 34. Absolutely, um, absolutely. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. We had birthday celebrations with friends and family this weekend. Um, on the account of having a child now and being a bit older, I'm not hungover because we kind of wrapped things up well before midnight. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was more about just spending time with people yesterday, which was uh, it was nice to have. And uh, it was quite relaxing getting sitting down last night being like oh i don't have loads of cleaning to do because it's already done house is tidy ready to go i'm not hung over i'm not falling all over the place yeah it's it's a nice uh there's there's pros and cons to getting older i guess there's, there's times when I, it's, it's, it'd be nice to stay up late and have a good old-fashioned ridiculous amount of alcohol and then be dead the next day but it's also nice to be absolutely. able to get up at a normal time and go oh actually I'm, i enjoyed yesterday and i feel okay <laughs> Yeah, and I managed to squeeze some gaming in last night as well, so yeah. happy birthday to me. I did not. I went to bed. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the precious hours there. That's what you've got to get them in. Yeah, it's, tr- it's true. Well, I've been always away for a few days before, so it's been quite a busy few days. So I think it's all caught up with me. Yeah, it's been a busy few days for news as well. It has, it has, which we'll get to in just a second. But before we get into it, make sure if you haven't already, you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell icon so you're kept in the loop of all of our fantastic content here at Gamer Guild TV, such as when Chris covered Star Wars Outlaws, which I think, should we save that for the news section, your impressions? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a whole chunk of this week's episode. Um, I got the gold edition. Thanks to my uh, wife buying it for my birthday, so I got the. I thought I'll get the early one, uh, and it obviously came out three days early. So yeah, our first look was actually up three days before, kind of like wider release, which was nice to actually get ahead of the curve for a change yeah. for a, for a first look. Usually we're either on the day of or when we get round to it on the Thursday. Yeah. So sometimes we can be a bit behind. So to actually have it up and out before the wider public was like yeah, it was quite quite good to have. And lots of people checked it out. So thank you. At best, it's usually for us recording the day of, so it might go up in the evening of. When everyone's already seen the opening and stuff, hours before we've even had a chance to play, because actual jobs. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in a weird one as well is we, we are part of the Ubisoft Creators Program, but they never seem to send us the codes for the games that I will actively play day and date or early. So we got uh, Skull and Bones. I keep getting X Defiant codes and stuff all the time, but I'm hanging fire for like Assassin's Creed or Star Wars and nothing comes our way, and it's like, damn it. But I bought the Gold Edition Ubisoft, so... I'm on your side. Indeed, and we obviously have our podcast, which comes out every single Monday on YouTube and podcast services. Chris, other than Star Wars Outlaws, what have you been playing? Uh, pretty much Star Wars Outlaws, but I did play before it arrived on Tuesday, uh, Time Splitters. So the Time Splitters trilogy, I think I mentioned it last week, it just dropped on PlayStation Plus. So I've been working my way through Time Splitters 1, 2, and 3. One incredibly short game. I actually forgot. Uh, that it has like no story it's basically just like he's a level go collect an item and come back to the start point end of level level two and it's just it's such like an old school game that's how shooters used um, to be it's just like a level thing yeah have you ever played uh time splitters no i don't think so i might have played a bit around yours when we we're kids but because because for those who don't don't know the lineage of time splitters it's basically it's everyone who rare who did golden eye and then did perfect dark it's basically a ton of guys who worked out rare after the success of those games they went away and formed free radical over in the uk made time splitters and when you play especially time splitters one 
it's basically like gold. Like the sound effects are golden eye sound effects, like literally lifted straight from one game into the next one. No copyright infringement in, in Ted, I'm sure. Um, and then, yeah, the second one introduces new characters, but the running around, you can almost tell like the map and level design and where enemies pop out from. It's like, if you put a James Bond skin over this, it, it, and the music almost and the, and the inventory sounds it's like it's it's essentially like golden eye you can see the indiv- individual developers mm. developers fingerprints on it it's like oh this is oh, how this 100%. developer does his level design kind of yeah he's got tro- his tropes that associate with that person absolutely and then they lean heavily into the comedy with time splitters so there's like a ton of characters and you you're traversing time so they have lots of fun with you're in like the western area then you're in the future then you're in the 1950s with gangsters and stuff and it just it has a lot of fun jumping around with with characters and time travel but yeah two and three uh, especially three is where like the storytelling elements start to pick up and it tells like just a wonderful like comic book-esque time travel story as a cartoon first person shooter and it's loads of fun the multiplayer was an absolute blast um unfortunately these editions don't come with any trophies as of yet so I've not got that much inclination to kind of like power through the game, especially now bigger games are coming out today and this week. But uh, yeah, I had fun with it. And then obviously I jumped over to Star Wars Outlaws, which I'll I'll save for the, the new segment, I guess. Yeah. How about yourself? Um, I've been working my way through Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So I've, roll, I've rolled credits. I have nice. actually only have two trophies left to get, both of them difficulty related, so they'll pop at the same time. Deadly mm-hmm. Obsession on that game, the difficulty is is a joke. It's not hard. It's not like, oh, it's difficult. The problem with it is you can only save at camps. So if you, mm-hmm. yesterday I actually had a bug. There's a section where you go through a huge, like several combat things, a couple of traversal sections, and one or two puzzle sections, and then it's like a kind of run away through a cave with all these enemies chasing you section. The camera bugged, so was, instead of the camera being behind Lara, it was in facing, facing towards Lara. All right, like Which, Crash Bandicoot style. Yeah, like Crash Bandicoot thing. And on easy, I, when I played, like, I think I played on normal, it didn't affect me at all. I didn't even realise that was not meant to be like that. Mm. But Deadly Obsession is like, as soon, soon as I started, I got killed by an enemy over and over again. Which you can't in its, see them. Can't see them yet. Which in itself isn't a bad problem if, when you load the game, you start at that section. When you mm. load the game, you start half an hour earlier. And I've got to go through several fights, several traversal sections, several puzzles. I've yeah. played that section about five times now. It yeah. It, there's a big cutscene before the section as well. It's like I don't know why. I know the whole thing about you meant to only save at camps, but this feels like there could be a save at that point. Yeah, it, it's just annoying because it's a bug that's screwing me over. So I'm going. I've reinstalled the game, and I'm right. hoping that fixes the bug. Because if not, I might have to just drop it and not get the platinum. Because it's just. Have you checked like YouTube videos to see yeah. if it is a bug or? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I, was, I had so a. Weird. I had, yeah, it's just the camera's facing the wrong place. Because there's a cutscene where she's running at the camera, and it's meant to cut mm-hmm. to like you taking control, facing forwards, like, facing normally. Yeah, yeah. But for me, it just loads the game up with me facing Lara. That's so weird. And there's an enemy jumps up straight away and gets me because I can't see it. Because there was a couple right. times I was like, I- I'm dying without an enemy being near me. And what's I'm on, going on, yeah. Because I'm on the high difficulty. It's one enemy touches me and it's game over. So it's That's very crazy. frustrating. But other than this this bug, and the, I hate that the save thing is just stupid. It doesn't. It's not fun. It doesn't really add to the challenge. It just adds annoyance. Because if you make one mistake, then you have to start half an hour ago. It just feels like mm. a way of wasting time rather than making it more difficult. But other than that, I've loved the game. Is Rise the Shadow third playing. one? No, Sh- Rise oh, is the sorry. second one. Shadow I'm playing Shadow, which is yeah. the third one. Yeah, that's the end of Lara's trilogy, unfortunately. Yes, so, so far. far. Yeah. Okay. But so yeah. you finished the story, haven't you? you know, yeah, yeah. It all ends. Kind sorry, of, well, it doesn't really end, does it? It's, it's like you, they could easily do a fourth, and it wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. That take, particular take story is done, but Lara is not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. Is that one the one that had the stuff with when you go back to the mansion in like almost like nightmares? Um, no, I, I don't oh, think right. that might be de- maybe oh, in DLC. Or DLC. Something. Sorry, I'm thinking DLC. Yeah, yeah, I think there's maybe a part where he plays young Lara in the Croft Manor. Yeah, and then in that. the DLC, she has nightmares and it's something to do with the crypt in the basement, and you get to play through it almost like a Resident Evil style. Um, well worth checking out if it's included in the version you've got. It isn't. I, I actually had a look oh. to see how much the DLC was. 
and it was like 17 quid and it's like uh, it's a bit more Ooh. than I'm willing to pay oh absolutely it's for, game, it's, what, it's for about year old now? I think you get about six different DLCs all of them are just like a single tomb mm. which is like there's probably the value there but I'm not I, I don't want to pay if it was like a fiver I'm sold but I don't yeah, as I, I don't want to pay that much it's probably worth it but I don't want to pay it that makes sense. Especially for an older game. No, no, I think yeah. it should be everything. After a certain point, DLC should default to like a, a set well, low price. I think it's weird because the version I've got, because I think mine was the PS Plus claimable version, It's although it's the definitive edition, it doesn't have the DLC in, which doesn't really make sense. My girlfriend's ver- version, I'm not sure whether she purchased it or it was a catalogue PlayStation Plus mm. one rather than claimable. She's got all the DLC. Right. Well, play yeah. check it out. Yeah, I've been watching it do a few tombs, um, but it's good other than the bugs. I did get to shoot a turkey with a flare gun. There's a trophy for that. I yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanksgiving. Yep, that's what the trophy's called. Is it? Oh. Yeah, yeah, well, literally. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was buried up there somewhere. Wow. So you know what? I think there's enough for that. Chris, would you like to introduce us to the... The... Graciously gathered Gamer Girl Gazette, aka the news. The news, and as always, the news is brought to you by our Guild Heroes, which you can join for as little as ninety nine p over on the YouTube channel. We thank you very much for your support, and don't forget we have our fifth year anniversary coming up on sep- September. 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 <laughs> 20, the, September the twenty eighth uh, to Saturday, where we will be doing. I think. Probably most of the day we'll be live live streaming on the YouTube channel, so come along, mm-hmm. say hi. We'll probably play. We haven't got this schedule sorted yet, but we'll, um, no doubt we'll be playing a collection of um, multiplayer games to get you guys involved. We'll be doing the podcast live, and if you've got any ideas, head over to our Discord. The links in the description below, where you can suggest games you want to play or even anything else that you might want us to do. Absolutely, yeah. Write in, write in questions if you want us to do like a Q and A or anything. Just write in questions to the Discord. Or send us a letter to P.O. Box Gamer Girl TV at... No, I don't know. Don't, don't do that. We don't actually have a P.O. Box. It'll just end up in some random dude's one. What, what, is P, what does P.O. stand for? Post office. P.O. Box? Is it just post office box? I think so, yeah. That's a bit lame. I was yeah. expecting something more exciting. Oh, well. The news! The news! And in the news this week, Chris, Star Wars Outlaws. Is it yes. in the news for all the right reasons? It's in the news for mixed reasons, but sorry, hit my mic there with the with the game. Um, yeah, Star Wars Outlaws. So the review roundups uh, are here. They've been dropping, as I said, public. Uh, they did the typical gate, which a lot of game publishers are doing now, where if you pay for the gold edition, you get early access. We saw it with Starfield last year. It seems to be the way devs can squeeze a little bit more juice out of like the the super fans, the eager fans who just want in a couple of days early. If 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 gamers were known for patience, Richie, this wouldn't be a business practice, but unfortunately gamers are not known for their patience um, or temperament. So here we are. It's now a thing. And you know what? I don't mind it because I usually do buy the gold edition ones for Ubisoft. I, I get them for Far Cry. I get them for Assassin's Creed because I always play the DLC on all these games. So for me, it's like a no-brainer. And thankfully through Amazon, the price actually dropped. I think it was like 90-something pound. And actually by by the time launch came around, it dropped down to 82 99 or 84 I actually saved a couple of quid off the initial like scary 90 odd pound price tag and I, by the same me I mean my wife but in terms of the game it's uh, sitting on Metacritic at 76 which is generally favourable it's probably what you predicted it's a Ubisoft game yeah. so sitting around the 7 to 8 was what you predicted, and 7.6 is bang in the middle of that scale. I, f- I think it's worth pointing out the spread of the reviews because uh, Metacritic splits the reviews between positive, ne- mixed, and negative. Mm-hmm. Only 1% of the reviews for PlayStation 5 are negative, 19, uh, 25% are mixed. Um, I think mixed is 6 and down, um, where mm-hmm. po- I, I think 70 and up is positive, which is 72%. Yeah. So most people are in that 7s and up. Yeah. And that's us looking at the critic reviews because I yeah. I do not trust user reviews at all. The way that's... Steam works and the way this works, I'm like, and review bombing is such a thing nowadays. I would never trust user reviews. That's why I bring up the split because if you switch over the user scores, there's forty four percent go positive, six percent mixed, and then fifty percent in negative. I think this game's yeah. being review bombed. 
I think there's a vendetta against this game because it's Star Wars, one of the biggest IPs on the planet, and similar to the Disney Plus shows, if you remember, the Acolyte just got cancelled, uh, which I enjoyed the Acolyte. I enjoyed it. I was looking forward to season two. So so was a lot of our friends when we discussed it. So then the game, I think there is an underlining thing where yeah. because it's not got lightsabers and because it's got a female protagonist, it it, it takes a hit for those nerdy gamers in the basement who need to get out a bit more. But again, this is why I think the critic reviews show through favorably um, a bit more. But it is ultimately, it's a Ubisoft score. See, it ain't going to win any Game of the Year awards. Right. It's not going to be voted for. It's not going to get any Razzie awards. It's very much just what you expect if you're a Ubisoft fan or you're familiar with Ubisoft titles and you're in the mood for Star Wars, this is what to expect. I think this is why I'm not necessarily against user reviews, but I think you have to read them in the context of the score they give. Because mm. pick, I've just picked out one to just kind of demonstrate that. I'm not going to say who it's from, but reading the first sentence, it's mid at best, but I'm going to give it free to balance out all the tens from corporate chills. If it's mid at best, you're looking five or sixes. So he's marking it down yeah. because of his perception of how other people are reviewing it. Which Not is just that's just stu- yeah that's just stupid. Give it the yeah, score that absolutely. you think it deserves. So let's um, let's look at some critic reviews before we get into my. I've played it for about probably. 12 to 15 hours now yeah. so I'm a chunk into the game um, I've not been doing as much of the campaign because by nature of it being open world I'm doing a lot of exploration and side quest stuff um, but let's have a look at let's see where should we start um, do, 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 do. I need to find a, a more reputable one there's plenty of like critic ones but I always like to see the big names just they're probably all perfectly reputable from the critics but if you're not familiar with the outlet it's a rivalry from the outlet I'm familiar with Absolutely. Uh, VGC 24-7. Ubisoft's USP is location, sense of place, beautiful recreations and restorations of ancient cities, buildings, temples, and vibes. The Star Wars galaxy absolutely evokes the same sense of wonder and has been recreated with just as much love and care here. Mos Eisley is no less real in public consciousness than Rome in the time of the Caesars. (laughs) And then they go on to say a bit more about it won't win any Game of the Year awards, but it'll definitely win a lot of hearts. Yeah, so I think really positive. that was an that was an eight as well. So that was a really positive one. Yeah, I think that's probably all right. IGN um, give it a seven, a seven out of ten or seventy. Um, Star Wars Outlaws is a fun intergalactic heist adventure with great exploration, but it's hindered by simple stealth, repetitive combat, and a few too many bugs at launch. It it's by the sounds of it, it's just not an ambitious game. It's that's how I. This impression I got in the previews and seeing the trailers and stuff, it does just look like, yeah, a generic action sci-fi game with the Star Wars skin. It almost feels like Ubisoft are hoping the Star Wars IP would carry the game a bit, and that's something Mm. I'm always sceptical of. And it's not bad. It's -hmm. not good. It could have been more ambitious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a Eurogamer, which is one that we usually uh, pull a lot of our news articles from. Actually, they gave it a two out of five, so a four out of ten, which seems very, very harsh. I don't know what they were maybe expecting, but it's a lot. It's a lot higher than a four out of ten. Like from from my again, it's all subjective, isn't it? But yeah. even just for the the polish that Ubisoft put it, like it is a triple A game. Putting it anything below five is like doing it a disservice, if you ask me. From Eurogamer, yeah, it doesn't um, look. From what I've seen, it doesn't look anywhere near that. Near that, they're definitely the outlier in it. But again, it's just one person's opinion, um, as we'll get into more on, on my opinion as well. Uh, but as you said, everyone generally sitting around the the seven point five mark seems to be the the average. Um, some high ones. Enemy give it a ten out of ten. Outlaws feels like a proper Star Wars game, but it's not tied down by the Skywalker saga. The world feels su- suitably massive, plenty of space to explore, skills to learn, and dodgy dealings to get involved with. Uh, developers pick the best moments from groundbreaking titles such as Uncharted, Tomb Raider, and The Witcher to create a unique, cohesive Star Wars title. Ten's very generous. <laughs> yeah. But so- some of the stuff in the actual words that they've wrote, I can see why. But enemies more pop culture isn't it in general rather than I, specifically gaming i tend so. to associate them with music more yeah. than anything else but they are a reputable yeah like 
company for coverage and stuff. Um, so, right, let's let's break into it, Richie. Before I go into my specifics, uh, is there anything you would like to know? As someone who's not bought the game, you're on the fence, you said you'll wait for the reviews. I'm one of your best friends of all time ever. True so story. whose review would you trust more than mine? Uh, what do you want to know? I do Star highly Wars trust your reviews. Um, the kind of thing I want to know is... Do you kind of agree that it's like a mid seven out of ten game? Yes. Seven or eight out of ten. I think I think seven point five is bang on the money, and there's some things this game does that are definitely four out of ten worthy, and there's some things it does that are eight, maybe pushing nine in terms of the story and the character elements. Yeah. But that's why collectively it's, it sits at a seven. <laughs> yeah, I think from what I've seen of the gameplay, everything looks kind of as expected, generic. Safe and easy, not doing anything mm-hmm. ambitious, which is why I think the gameplay looks maybe at like seven out of ten. It's not bad; it's tried and tested, but mm-hmm. it doesn't look like it's doing anything particularly interesting or anything that's like kind of unique that you could only do in a Star Wars game. It just looks like it's a third-person yeah. shooter with stealth elements. Mm-hmm. That's the not- um, the uniqueness. What I found, what I've actually see, felt, has been quite refreshing is the lack of Jedi and lightsabers. Yeah. So for those who don't know, you play as a, a scoundrel called k and you have a little uh, sidekick character called Nyx, who's like a little, looks like Stitch from Lilo and Stitch, and he's he, he is utilising the stealth elements. He can press buttons and unlock doors. He can steal from people. Uh, he can distract people. He can jump on guards. He, can, he actually plays dead on the floor to distract guards, and then you can jump on them from behind. Um but yeah, it's interesting because you're basically you're playing off against the the syndicates in the Star Wars world, so the Huts, the Pikes, the Crimson Dawn, who you've seen scattered throughout Disney Plus shows and stuff. But no Jedi, so there's no like superhero stuff going on. It's very much you you go and find missions like you would in a Red Dead Redemption, for example. You 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 hook up with random outlaws and you ask them questions and you learn about the world and the dodgy dealings going on and why the Huts don't get on with the Crimson Dawn and who's backstabbing who. And there's a lot of interesting storytelling within the missions. And it's actually been quite refreshing with like, oh, you don't need a lightsaber. You're not going to go hack down 50 people and, and blow doors off and rip ships out the sky and stuff. It's very much a case of, no, no, you might get caught. And there's a wanted system like GTA where you get put on high alert. And depending on how you play off on these factions, it's got, um, I was going to say, uh, what's the infamous? It's got like an infamous system where if you do, con- every time you do a couple of contracts, you'll have an option to pick an option that favors maybe the huts but it screws over the pikes. So then you have almost like a wanted meter where you aren't allowed to go into certain territories on the map because it's pike territory, and you've been doing deals with the huts. But on the flip side, I could totally screw over Jabber and his friends, and I'll be allowed to go into pike territory, but not the hut territory without my wanted level going up. So there's an interesting world dynamic where, depending on which contracts you're opting for and whose side you're willing to take, it's almost like a delicate balancing act of exploration. And and that, for me, has been uniquely different than you have a lightsaber, go to kill all these things and do everything like a massive superhero. It's it's a very different style of gameplay, and it's refreshing for a Star Wars title, because we've not had that. Every Star Wars game since, like, Dark Forces has been, you're the hero. You can do anything possible. Yeah. And this isn't. You you are just, like, a nobody on a, on a planet. I think there was, like, Shadows of the Empire on the N64 where you cast as mm-hmm. just some random dude. Um, I don't it's think like he a ever... a trooper, wasn't it? Yeah. He's... So, uh, it's, that sounds quite refreshing. It's like, now, now, this is where I think the game. If, if everything in the gameplay is kind of just by the books and it's like feels seven out of ten, I think a game can stand on its own legs if it's narratively good enough. Uncharted, Uncharted doesn't really do anything that particularly interesting. And actually, I think there is some when I replayed them, some things like the traverse mechanics aren't as good as you remember. That game can be a bit buggy at times, a bit sketchy. Yeah, there's times when they would just jump off a cliff. Yeah. But it's well, so funny. narratively good and the, everything that the game feeds back into the narrative. That's what yeah. makes it great. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up that because it does have uncharted elements of traversal where uh, last night I was doing a mission. I was inside one of the big, you know, the big rebellion cruisers from the prequels. It was a crashed one of them. 
and I was exploring it, and it very much had the yellow paint on the ledges, and yeah. I'm climbing up uh, grates, and I'm leaping across with a grappling hook, and I'm unlocking doors um, with like puzzle mechanics. Like one of your gun features has like an electric shock, which triggers batteries, which open doors. So you kind of have to figure out the puzzle mechanic to get to the next area. Um, stuff falls away, so you end up like dropping and sliding down a ramp and having a grapple hook before falling to your death. So it's, it's it does have those uncharted tropes, and very much like you just described, I've jumped into holes many times and died. I've missed a ledge and fell off many times. It's not perfect, but climbing around inside a giant rebel cruiser, aesthetically in Star Wars world. Really, really fun. Looking for, I think I was looking for like a battery pack or something in the buried in the engine room. Um, really fun. However, you say about doing the basics right, this is where the game does let itself down on some of the basics. So there's a big focus on um, Kay's pistol, or a blaster, I should say, yeah. because they're going for that Han Solo scoundrel look. And as the game goes on, you upgrade your blaster to have like ion bolts and rapid fire and better accuracy. And you can pick up weapons throughout the game. So when a stormtrooper drops the pit, their rifle, you can pick that up. Snipers, you can pick them up. Grenade launches. However, you were saying in chat, it's very basic. Mm-hmm. This game does not let you carry a secondary weapon because of the focus on the blaster. And sorry, I mean, you can pick it up, but she cannot hold on to it. So, Richie, this, this is where the game needs a patch 100%. I'm holding a stormtrooper's blaster that I've just picked up because I've killed one of them. You want to keep it? If I if I climb a ladder, guess what happens? You drop it. Drop it. If I do a roll forward to avoid some gunfire, guess what happens? You drop it. Drops it. Yeah. I think this and is that where is bullshit. I've seen Just some of the make an animation so they put it on their back and they keep a secondary weapon. I've seen some comments where people say it's like gameplay design from 10, 15 years ago. I wonder if that's the kind of stuff they're picking up on. Like, it feels like it's... why would she drop this? Maybe you just build into like almost like a durability system. Once you fired so many shots of your blaster, it overheats, it breaks, or you run out of ammo, and then she just cho- tosses it because it's useless to her. Yeah, but it, I feel like they've obviously got in a room and went, "No, the focus is on the blaster." They don't like pick up the like blasters. Upgrade and stuff. <laughs> it's yeah, only like have them are very one. scripted situations or something. So you yeah, get to a and, situation where she has to pick up a grenade launcher to take out something in ATAT or something. Then she, when Absolutely. you move on, she puts it down because it's only u- usable yeah. for that section. Yeah, and that's where some of the gameplay things are frustrating. There's a lot of focus on stealth, which does feel a little bit like Tomb Raider and Chad. You're sneaking around, and there's something where I was inside like an M- an Imperial hangar, and you have to make your way around, and you use you use Nick's little side sidekick to go distract people, and you're essentially trying to sneak up into the room to hack the computer to, to release the it, tractor beam to get out. It's very much part of like a New Hope, and as soon as you're seen, the mission restarts. And it's one of them where, as you were saying, your frustrations with the Tomb Raider and dying and having them sent back to a checkpoint, that's very yeah. unfavorable. This happened a few times in some of the early missions, and I was sat there thinking, right, I've been seen twice, I've triggered an alarm once, and the stealth isn't... If you, Considering the Ubisoft are known so much for Assassin's Creed, the stealth could have done with a lot more polish. So I'm being seen like two, three times, and it's resetting me almost like right back to the start of the level. And as you said with Tomb Raider, once you've done that like four or five times, you get really fed up with the game very, very quickly. And I think because that happened to me a few times so early on, it was like, this is how they're introducing me to the game, the world, is by putting me on a stealth mission that I'm struggling to get past. And it's almost like, what? who thought this but was a good idea? At least I can make the argument for Tomb Raider is I'm playing on the highest difficulty and it's, you're told that you... When you go in, you can only save at the at the camps and stuff. It's mm-hmm. a bit annoying that there's such big gaps between them and second sections, and because of a bug, I'm having problems. But this is not the way I'm not playing this game the way um, Shadow of the Tomb Raider the way it's intended. This is an yeah. additional level of difficulty rather than this is the normal presentation. Yeah. So it's that that was one of my um, but 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 it's interesting because then in a way like once you get deeper into the game and you start doing other stealth missions you can kind of see that they're trying to force you to think about your approach a bit more. Um, but then again, when you said about fifteen year old design, when I think back, like we had stealth in Metal Gear Solid Two that was fantastic and it was fun and it was dynamic and it was multi level and you could sneak, you could interact with cameras and this is very much like that. They've got those tropes, but they've somehow done them worse than a game did twenty odd years ago. I don't, so it's it's that's why I yeah. really don't think it helps itself. 
I, I no. have this. Li- I have a litmus test for any kind of game that uses a very well-known IP, like a Star Wars or Harry Potter. Something is if you take the IP away, what's the quality of the game? Mm. That's what I use with Marvel Avengers. When you got to the multiplayer, once the IP was no longer doing the heavy lifting, like it wasn't the single player, the game mm. sucked. It was just boring and bland. And like, yes, I'm playing as Hulk. It doesn't feel like I'm playing as the Hulk. I wonder yeah. if this is suffering a bit, where a you kind of need the game if you're using the IP. You want your IP to do the heavy lifting. You need the gameplay f- constantly funneling back into us. Yeah. It just sounds like a quite generic third person shooter, really, with some actually dated concept ideas. Yeah. That's that's fair. There's there's an element to, to pin to flip back over to like again positive wise. Ubisoft make some of the most beautiful realized worlds you've ever seen. As long as you ignore and, the NPCs. Yeah, as long as you ignore the NPCs. Uh, with the the world they've created, I will say, Massive, who, and Entertainment who made it, it doesn't look like a Ubisoft game, which is what we often say is like a lot of their assets are copy and paste. This is bespokely Star Wars. Like It feels like I'm in a Star Wars cantina. The NPCs, as much as their animations aren't great, they are all the same races and creatures and cultures we see in the movies. Very well, like they're scattered throughout. There's, there's very unique ones. There's some very different ones, and a lot of common ones that you'll see. Like every canteen you go into, like the the DJ, the singer, they're all different creatures and robots. And playing Sabak, the card dealer is like a special, unique card robot, and it's it's very Star Wars. Um, we obviously criticized Starfield last year for its space exploration. This does it better. Like you actually leave the planet's surface, you go through the clouds, you go into the atmosphere, you end up in space. And then from space, you can light speed to your next location and it does the whole Star Wars light speed action and it feels Star Wars. It's not oh, going to a menu, then into another menu to do to, to get from planet to planet. And it's it, the aesthetic of the menus as well with the Star Wars font and the color palette, it looks great. The UI design is, is very polished, um, which is when you pivot from bad to good, it's like this is why the game is ultimately seventh. There's some fantastic stuff getting ticking all the right boxes and then they're letting themselves down in other areas um I'm trying to think what one what, what of my other critiques it's like daft little things like Kay's hair they've obviously gone for a hairstyle that's i, I don't know like different it's probably, it's probably, it looks a like a hairstyle is, is from like the 70s or 80s when yeah, style was originally yeah. came out so i get i actually get that i understand where they're yeah. going there and she has a speeder bike, so she's in that kind of like the modders, um, like nineteen fifties diner bicycle moped, driving around eating pancakes and milkshakes kind of stuff. Her hair glitches through fucking everything. Like if you can't do it right, give her a different hairstyle because through her collar jacket, it it moves in the wind at times when it doesn't need to, and it just has like this a pixelated like granular look to it around the edges where. I've hair is a that. very fine quality to get right, and a lot of games try and make it look right, and it just looks fuzzy and not like hair. I, I, I get the feeling that this game could have done with another year or two in production, probably to make a bit a bit more depth to get the game mechanically polish out a few things a bit more, and really maybe try to add some something unique and ambitious in there. It does mm-hmm. feel like they're very distinctly a seven out of ten game to me. Absolutely fine. You're gonna enjoy it if you like Star Wars. But I don't think it, it doesn't sound to me. I think I've made the right choice waiting for the reviews, and I'd, I'd like to so. play if it comes. If I see it on play, in the PlayStation Store for forty quid, I might go. You know what? Now's the time. Yeah. But and seventy quid, it feels a bit. I want yeah. that's all seventy pounds. It's a lot of money, which pushes it into the category of you're going up against games that have significantly better polish, like. Mm-hmm. You need if you're going to have this level of game. It feels like a very solid double A, actually. The way I'm, the, from a lot of the reviews, uh, no, it's, it is it is triple, triple A in yeah. in every aspect except for some of those little bugbears. And and ultimately, that is the ironic thing is because I'm a Star Wars fan, <laughs> and I know what Ubisoft games are. I'm having a great time in it. Like I genuinely am. Like the the early bug things, the bugbears that I had, and I maybe did myself a disservice because I listened to some of the early reviews and some of the early ones, especially to some of the content you and me listened to, Richie, they were very negative on yes, it. Yes. Yeah. So I almost went in being like, it can't be that bad, surely. So I almost had like blinkers but on a little bit. And I'm actually, thinking, do I need to... That can make you enjoy things more if your expectations are lower and it does better well, out, that, super yeah. expectations. And, and I think that's what's happened. And I know we looked at the Metacritic reviews at the beginning, but then realistically, like the more I'm playing this game, the more I'm enjoying it. And it is the realization it's basically like a Red Dead Redemption, but with a Star Wars skin. 
It's got the missions. It's got the various characters. It's got the the different types of uh, approaches to things. I'm taking down camps. I'm collecting intel. I'm playing off factions against each other. I have my blaster. I have my speeder bike or your horse, for lack of a better term, which ironically, you press a, um, right on the D-pad and it summons your speeder from absolutely nowhere, materializes before your eyes. Don't mind um, that. Not quite, on a, not quite on a rooftop like Roach did I, back in The Witcher. Yeah, but I actually don't mind that because it's a breath of the wild. One it's of the things I hated game. about that game was if you're too far away from your horse, you just have to go capture another horse. And it's like, oh, I can't be bothered with that. <sighs> Again, so I don't yeah. mind it. Just, just that It's gamified. It's fine. Yeah. And this is where it's a video game ass video game where, yes, you've got a big map, you've got loads of side missions to do, which I'm enjoying doing the side missions, building up my bounty and getting credits to upgrade my ship and credits to upgrade my blaster and learning about the world, meeting new people from different syndicates. I haven't met Jabba the Hutt yet. Um, I've just got a, a, a new sidekick character as well, which is the droid who you see on the cover art, that that guy. Yeah. Um, I've just met him. He's quite cool from what I've seen so far. And I'm generally just having a good time where this is just going to be a slow burn for me. I'm just going to enjoy the Star Wars world without lightsabers. And yeah, it's it's a 7 out of 10. And if you like Star Wars and you like Ubisoft games, it's probably for you. But as you said, Richie, if it's not pressing, then maybe wait. Or maybe Ubisoft plus it. Yeah, you you broke up from my side for that thing, so I don't know if I caught, caught what you're saying, but I feel like I've set my expectations for this game right, and I do still want to play this game. And Ubisoft Plus, if that came to PlayStation, that that's my that's how mm-hmm. I'm doing it. Um, yeah, I could consider Ubisoft Plus and playing that. And Xbox, but I've talked to Dev about my issues with Xbox at the moment, and entirely down to my personal set circumstances, nothing to do with Xbox itself. Yeah. Um, bring out the handheld Xbox. I know there's other things I want to dedicate to Xbox One though. Yeah. What what I would urge then is, and what I've seen is because of the kind of review bomb and stuff going on, if you go, go on any social media page and just look at the comments because I've seen a lot of people in some of the Facebook pages that I'm involved for, like Gamers Over 30, um, Gaming UK, Gaming Dads, all that kind of stuff. Is there's a lot of people over the weekend have posted, like anyone else playing Outlaws, anyone enjoying Outlaws. And if you look at the comments... 95% of the people going, I'm having a great time, I'm having a blast, I'm having a lot of fun. And actually there's very little negativity in the social media comments, yeah. which is counteractive if, to what the review bombs are telling us. So, if, yeah. When you look at the reviews, just just ignore the, ex- largely just ignore, it's a good rule of thumb for any game, ignore the extremes, maybe read them. But if you read a review and you go, this person's cr- clearly salty about something, this game's not what he wanted it to be, so he's been very hard, overly critical, he's give it a 2 out of 10. Because yeah. it's not as good as he was expecting. It's like, well, not as good as he expecting might be a six out of ten, not a two. Yeah. And we likewise the on la- the other side, when people are giving it a ten out of ten, it's like, why are they giving this a ten out of ten? Or because of the yeah. people are review bombing it, that's just as bad in my opinion. Yeah. Like, we know the last Jedi wasn't as great as everyone expected, but let yeah. it go. There's been other properties that came out. Andor was fantastic. The Mandalorian's great. The Acolyte was good. There's something about let Star go, Wars guys. fans. Like, <laughs> no matter what Star Wars do does. A lot of Star Wars fans who probably have nothing better to do mm. seem to hate it. It's like if you hate everything it does, are you a fan? I'm it's, a Star Wars fan. I don't love everything yeah. Star Wars does. I didn't mind the Last Jedi when I watched it. It was it was by far the weakest Star Wars film. Mm-hmm. I didn't yeah. really like Solo that much. Although on re rewatch, it's better than I remember. It was just disappointing, and it felt like yeah. a fan service entirely. A movie made out of fan, pointless fan service. Choices were made. Choices were made, and I think that the movie felt completely unnecessary. In, yeah. But it's, I still enjoy it. Yeah, it's one of the rare, and it will get more of them as time goes on, but we're in this weird place in the world right now where, as you said, Star Wars is an IP. It's been around for nearly, well, over half a century, nearly. And what that leads is you've got fans that are 10 year old and 60 odd year old as well and that's a lot of varying def- demographics to appeal yes. to and now they're part of disney as well they're also in parks and cartoons and it, it covers every demographic under the umbrella and unfortunately you cannot ever please everyone no i think i, I enjoy the clone wars stuff it, but i guarantee my dad wouldn't give two shits about it but he's a star wars fan yeah the clone wars he wouldn't play was a the line as it was always yeah. intended to be yeah but we would, and and this is why it's just you have to just accept it for what it is. It's it's all fiction, think, guys. It's none of it's real. Sorry. Yes, it is. But yeah, 
But if you want, if you want a decent exploration in some of the Star Wars worlds, more so than we've ever got. Remember, we've never had an open world Star Wars game like this. The Jedi games are great, but they are still very linear. This is go in any direction, find people, meet people, explore, do missions, pick up bounties like you would in in a Red Dead or an Assassin's Creed and stuff and it, it's good enough to have fun if you're a Star Wars fan I think that I think that's a message to take away it's not a great game but if you're a Star Wars fan you'll probably and you just set your expectations right you're going to have a good time yeah absolutely uh, the, the amount of easter eggs and stuff will be enough to satiate you until yeah. the next Mandalorian I, season <laughs> the thing is if this was priced at say £50 instead of 70 I'd probably pull the trigger on that if I didn't have Zelda Echoes of Wisdom in a few weeks yeah so as I, I as I I'm enjoying Tomb Raider at the moment. I've played in chat previously. I've got two more Tomb Raider games to go to fill mm-hmm. up that gap before I close of Wisdom. I was I was hoping this is why I played Shadow first actually before Tomb Raider One and Rise because I've played them before. I hadn't played Shadow. Right. So because I had an eye on Star Wars Outlaws, so ideally I was thinking, you know what, if this comes out and it's, it is better than I expect it to be, mm-hmm. at least I'll finish the story in Shadow. And then I can move on. I think I've made my decision. I'm going to stick with Tomb Raider and maybe pick this up on when in six months' time when it's like half price or it comes to PlayStation Plus or Ubisoft Plus happens yeah. or something something like that. It's still on my radar. I still want to play it. I think I'll still enjoy it. I, I just you will. I've just got other things I'm I'm prefer to play it right now. Um, a, a telling sign will be this time next week when we record. And a little tiny character drops into our lives called Astrobot this Friday. Oh, yeah. I mean, I need to buy Astrobot. And that's that's when it's like, am I still playing Outlaws next week or am I all in on little Astrobot's world? I I actually, I'd be interested in your review once you finish the story because I've heard some reviews where we're talking about how the character development goes on, which you can't really comment on after a few hours. You need the whole experience, I think. You need to get... Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see how you review it once you're done. Yeah. As a as a slight pivot now away from Star Wars and on the cusp of Astrobot coming out, because I'm hyped for Astrobot. My yeah. controller's coming. Can't <laughs> wait. Um, as is the game. Also birthday presents, by the way. I'm not buying any of them myself, so it's kind of like they're free. <laughs> so it adds that extra bit of special. Have you seen the character, the characters that have been confirmed just from the trailer alone? No. No, like, I have not looked into like a breakdown or anything. So I'll I'll spot I guess spoilers for Astrobot if you were but you know what the game is it's gonna it's gonna be another love letter to video game history and we're talking about but content looks, that's in trailers it's not really spoilers yeah it's it's in the trailer um there's a lot of characters missing who are gonna be in it like PlayStation IP they don't mention and they're going to be in it but it looks like they've actually gone beyond first party Richie oh which has got me like oh shit this could be like amazing so just really quick i'm going to rattle off this so quick uh kratos atreus from god of war aloy from the horizon nathan drake uncharted ratchet from ratchet and clank grivet clank kit jack and daxter sly cooper spike from ape escape uh, a monkey from ape escape parappa the rapper uh wanderer from shadow the colossus mono from shadow agro the horse from shadow the crosses uh trico from the last guardian eco from eco ryu ken and raiden uh from street fighter uh raiden gray fox psycho mantis from metal gear solid <laughs> Psycho Mantis Astrobot, Richie. How yeah. cool is that going to be? Uh, Leon be. Kennedy, Chris Redfield from Resident Evil, Jill Valentine as well. Uh, the yellow, white, and red Loco Rocos from the Loco Roco PSP series. <laughs> but you didn't expect to see them. Um, Spyro the Dragon. Not Fest Party, but evidently Formally. a PlayStation mascot. So they've reached out to Xbox to get yeah. this, which is awesome. Uh, Octodad from Octodad, Deadliest Catch. Great PS Vita game, loved it. Cat uh, from Gravity Rush, Dante from Devil May Cry, Pyramid from Silent Hill, um, Soul Bad Guy from Guilty Gear series. It's, it's, it's a love letter. It's a deep to play- cut. It's a love letter to PlayStation, isn't it? They've looked at what are the kind of greatest hits of PlayStation over the decades, like even mm-hmm. including like cult classics. Let's get them in here. Knack is in here. <laughs> uh, talk about cult classic, Richie Buzz. The 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 host of the uh, can you remember the game with the buttons the Buzz TV show with the PS2 no. where you had the it was the game show where you got four controllers with like red yellow blue and green I and it was quiz questions and you press the buzzer it was basically like who wants to be a millionaire kind of show for family fortunes or something um, he's on that you'll recognize his face he's got like an egghead like point blank looking face um, Joker and Teddy and Aegis from Persona series uh, Dart from the Legend of Dragoon. 
Um, and Rudy from Wild Arms. And obviously that's not including all the other PlayStation 1s, Crash Bandicoot and stuff like that. But it, from what you've seen from the trailer, if you think it looks cool, just wait till this Friday and the full list of people going, oh my word, this character's in it. I can't believe they got this character. But yeah, I'm hyped for Astro. I'm telling you, Astrobot could be a dark horse for Game of the Year this year. It's going to be so it... whimsical. I don't think it's we're going to get the, the polish of the game and how well Astrobot's Playroom was on just on launch of PlayStation. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a dark horse. I think it's just, I think you look at it as a dark horse because it's a platformer. <sighs> yeah, but there's no reason so. why a platformer can't be in the conversation with Game of the Year. Yeah. I mean, now Outlaws is out, and that's seemingly not going to be in it. Yeah. And Assassin's Creed Shadows is probably the last big... Indiana Jones, maybe? Isn't like, that... There's very Indiana few Jones games that are left to come out. Oh, yeah, it is. Well, for official Game of the Year, but our yeah. Game of the Year awards, maybe, as well. But, yeah, so Astrobot hype. So am I still playing Outlaws? Is, is it in-depth next week? Or do I totally drop everything for my little Ast- Astrobot guy? I'm such a sucker for 3D platformers. You are? Um, are you a sucker? For arena shooters, though, I am absolutely not. Yeah, um, I don't. And neither is anyone else. No, by the looks of it. So we're talking about Concord. So we have the review roundup, and it's mixed. It's mixed. I, I, yeah, it it's sitting at what a, a sixty-two, so a six out of ten, which isn't far off Outlaws. It's just a different type of six out of ten because of the nature yeah. of it being live service. And there's no um, user reviews up yet on Metacritic at the time of the thing. One of the things that is concerning me is how few PC reviews are. Because I think a game mm. like this kind of needs the PC get crowd in, involved to keep it going as well. It just... Well, I don't know if a it's, if it's six out, 62 out of 100 is good enough. No, to give people a bit of context, we'll give you some actual reviews. So Game Rant gave it a 7 out of 10. They said, those wanting to roll the dice on Concord will find an excellent first-person shooter full of exciting abilities, intense battles, and eye-popping visuals. The game's character design, premium price point, and lack a general lack of interest from the public may make it so Concord never really gets a chance. And so potential consumers need to weigh the risks of investing $40 on a game that may be dead before too long. Personally, I'm glad to have played Concord and will continue playing it as much as possible, and it'll be a sad day when it comes with the player count dwindles to a point where it no longer makes sense to support it. Hopefully Concord defies the odds and becomes one of Sony's long-lasting live service experiments. This is the problem I've had with a lot of the Concord kind of fervour in the news, is it in some way, and I don't know how this happens, Richie, it's, it's one of the magic things of the internet, because people were talking so much about, is Concord going to succeed?, it's almost been like a self-fulfilling prophecy where because people made such a big deal about it succeeding or not thereof succeeding um, or the interest levels. Where guilty It's of almost that. like, yeah, it's fell into it where all the reviews mention the lack of interest and the price point. It's like, but if you weren't talking about that and you said the game's great, your review focused on the quality of the game rather than bringing in outside factors of like, oh, it might not be supported for long, so you might want... It. You know what I mean? I feel like there's an ulterior motive to a lot of the... Criticism where Helldivers didn't get any of that. No, Helldivers I think was a surprise hit. Where I think I think that one of the problems with Concord is the fact that everyone's aware that PlayStation pivoted to like um, games as a mm-hmm. server style and then changed their mind. And Concord seemingly is one of the few games in that period that it was probably too far along to actually can. I mean, yeah. they were happy to can The Last of Us. Maybe Concord yeah. was just pretty much done, so it's like we've invested a lot of money. We have to get this out. Yeah. Um, to to back it up, we've got Push Square as well, PlayStation site. Um, Push Square give it a seven out of ten as well. Concord is a clean and well-meaning first-person shooter with no shady business practices to boot. Its lack of real identity is an issue, and it's difficult to determine just how much Sony is going to get behind it long term. However, there is a polished, beautiful presented experience on offer here, with some interesting tactical team building systems and sublime animations. Firewalk's debut may not be out of this world, but it's genuinely pretty good overall. See, it's interesting, I think, with a games as a service thing, you, you have to think of why would a publisher like Sony go for games as a service? The idea is they want to have a huge player base that sticks behind the game for years and gets involved in season passes and microtransactions and cosmetics so they make a lot of money over it. Mm-hmm. So as a 7 out of 10, I think as, if you just purely take it as from a game point of view, 7 out of 10 can have a long lifespan if it's supported. 
So I think where someone like Push Square are getting at is like, is it good enough to get enough players in to make Sony want to support it in the long term? Or but yeah. it could also if you support it, it could grow into a nine out of ten eventually. Because these yeah. games should be seen in a long term thing, not launch just in launch window. But is the launch window strong enough? It's it's complicated. Um It's very I, complicated. I'm kind of in the view where I think games as a service is an incredibly crowded area, and in order to st- to take to build a user base, you basically have to steal it from another game, mm-hmm. which means I think you have to be significant. Either you have to a game needs to be you have to target a game that's kind of just naturally falling off. It's at the end of its cycle, or you have to be significantly better than something else to get people to. Because a lot of people, I think. You'll see a lot of Twitch streamers jump o- who will play things like Overwatch, jump over to Concord and yeah. stream it for a few weeks. But if they're seeing their views can't go down, they'll switch back to Overwatch. Yeah, And that, I think game. that matters a lot in a game like this. Yeah, I, I agree. So uh, just to round out then, IGN also gave it a 7 out of 10. So this is by far like a good game. And a lot of the comments say that. So Concord isn't the most innovative or content-heavy shooter you could play, but with such fantastic, fantastic competitive gameplay, 16 compelling characters to master, 12 well-designed maps, it's got the makings of something that could go the distance in months and years to come. In fact, it's a testament to its first-person shooter tropes that even while it has virtually non-existent story and a serious need of a signature game mode, I still found myself losing hours and hours of PvP to its charms. Hopefully, the live service roadmap will do its thing and show it is a promising shooter the love it needs to become something truly special. But right now, it's at least good enough for me to recommend trying out. So, lots of positive praise in yeah. there. Do you think there's a I do... problem with these games not having enough content on launch? That's holding them back a bit. I purely think Concord is suffering. It's it's saturation. It the reality is is the people out there playing Overwatch and Valorant and Apex and stuff and Call of Duty. Their content and they just the those games supply enough content that why would you turn your head and look at something brand new that doesn't have a unique pull? Like I said, it's very much Guardians of the Galaxy. Which means it doesn't have it doesn't have its unique pull, and I think all of the other games did at launch. Apex had like its crazy stealth launch, Call of Duty is Call of Duty. Like the Overwatch is so huge because of those characters and they put so much money into creating those characters and their storylines and stuff. It's it kinda went beyond the game into like comics and animation and stuff where this does just look like a rip off Guardians of the Galaxy and <laughs> there's a great Guardians of the Galaxy game out there if you want to play it. Yeah, and there's great feel, shooters out there. I almost feel it's ten years too late. Overwatch is yeah. already fi- is already established, or if you want to go free to play, Valorant exists. So it's like, why would you play Concord over Valorant? Is Valorant free? Is yeah. like this is forty pound. Remember as well. Yeah. And I get what Sony were doing, where they were like, "Oh, we'll do what Hell Divers did, where we'll put a lower price tag on it and get people in." It's like this should have been, I think, early reviews and previews. They would have been better putting it on PlayStation Plus and going from there. But because they took the good guy approach and didn't microtransaction the share of it, I feel like Sony probably looked and went, we need to ask for an upfront cost to make some money back. Because the, they said, I think there is a season pass, but there's no, like... I think the game actually got praised in its reviews for lack of microtransactions. Yeah. But I feel like in the in the world of live service they're looking to oh, get into, I you think... can't ask for £40 up front and hope for the best. A game like this, I think the expectation is that there would be microtransactions, and microtransactions aren't mm-hmm. necessarily evil. It depends Especially how the thing. Game. I don't like loot boxes because it's random, but if you can just go into a store and buy something, whether you mm-hmm. earn, earn your credits in game or you earn the credits via a credit card, as long as you're not marketing that at children, which I think is a different story to marketing at, marketing towards adults. I don't think microtransactions are evil in a game, a live service game. It keeps the lights on in the end of the day. Yeah. So I think it's kind of caught where Hell Divers to me doesn't come across as a games as a service. It feels more like a single player game that you have to be playing with other people. Well, because it's PVE, yeah, it got such a big win because you weren't fighting dickheads on the internet from the other part of the world on the mic. You were you were fighting AI. 
yeah and as a team that that really got everyone to like back up behind it whereas this is 6v6 or 5v5 and already we're hearing people saying they're struggling to match make after the launch week and yeah. once that gets out, you, you can put that genie back in that bottle. Um, I mean, we've got an article from Eurogame that says how many they've estimated to have sold. And uh, IGN analysis, Sam and Carlos, has apparently looked at um, the Steam figures, which is around, he puts it around 10,000 units. And based on player count and matchmaking, he puts PlayStation around 15,000. So that's a, a grand total of 25,000 copies on two platforms for a triple A game that's been in development for eight years. And it's this studio's first game. And it's so bad because the reviews are saying they've made a good, competent game. It's just, should this be the game PlayStation tasked them to make? And will they survive? Like, that's the harsh reality where we're, we're seeing companies like, remember Tango? Xbox were like, oh, yeah. you just put a Hi-Fi Rush. That was absolutely fantastic, critical acclaim. But sorry, you're gone. Bungie laying off everyone. Not like, anymore. This is... Tango got was saved. Well, now they have, yeah. <laughs> but it, I think for Firewalk, obviously they were acquired by PlayStation in during Concord's development. So they obviously saw something that was like, we want to bring these guys on board. And I'm hoping it was maybe maybe not for Concord. It was for the talent. And hopefully that saves them because selling 25,000 copies to a platform that has how many units in the wild now? 65 million? Yeah, that's a bad return on investment you, for on any I, business. They should, I think Sony should have been brave with this game and probably backed it to you know what we're going to stick to some PlayStation Plus. Yeah, me too. But one I month, think it probably Septem- will be soon Septem- enough. Yeah, but is it too little, too late? Now is that now in the mission of defeat? If, if they went September the first, it dropped on PlayStation Plus Premium. Mm-hmm. Maybe you go just Premium only. Yeah. So if you have PlayStation Plus Premium, this is now in your your catalogue. So you maybe then you people might go. You know what? I'm on extra. I'll pay up. Oh, how much is it? Oh, it's only going to cost me an extra twenty quid for the year to catch up for the year. Something depending on how far you are through your subscription. Yes, yeah, so I'll go for it. And then you suddenly you inflating that player base. You're getting more hands on. Where you might yeah. people, get people go. You know what? It is a solid game. It's not amazing, but I'm having I'm having fun, and it's cost me nothing. And you keep that. You get that player base going. The death of these sort of games is your player base. If you don't have any people playing it, it doesn't matter how good it is. That's it. At the time of and recording on September the 1st, would you like to hazard a guess at how many players are currently playing it right now on a weekend, midday, in the UK? On what platform? Uh, this is just Steam numbers because I, I can't get So Yeah, Steam number 100 to 200? 61. Yeah, that's unfortunate. 61. I More people are probably playing... Gollum. Go, I'm going to check. I'm going to check. It's entirely... We, we talked about that number yesterday. Um, and for doing like, this beta, that, like, Gollum was out pacing it. Uh, no, Gollum's got four players. <laughs> oh, wow. <what? laughs> Four players. Poor Gollum. I, I mean, it did come out a while ago. Yeah. Um, but... Gollum's 24-hour peak was 11. Concord's 24-hour peak was 125. What hell so doing better than Gollum. Because that's probably a better Benchmark. benchmarker, yeah. Helldivers Steam uh, player. Diff- uh, completely different style of the game, is. but both PlayStation. Um, play st- playing Helldivers right now, 12,827. So just 12,780 um, odd more than... I- your brand new first person game that just launched last week. I do hope it finds its feet, but I think it's just, it's an uphill battle for it. It's it's doomed. It's if you asked me about this a couple of weeks ago, I would have said just like Suicide Squad, just like Gotham Knights, is this isn't the game the market's asking for, and this is all the devs and companies and publishers chasing a trend eight years too late. Yeah. And uh, if they'd have just stuck to their guns and made what they were good at and what these studios probably wanted to make, which is Great single player narrative experience, maybe with a bit of multiplayer. Hell, bring back the PS3 days, Richie, when you got a great single player game, no, and then disagree. a little dabble of multiplayer added on. I strongly no, disagree. I yeah, I, I prefer games to either factions. be multiplayer or be single player. I don't like the uh, crossover, could... like especially when there's trophies involved. Like just, just be, oh, yeah, yeah, know what you are and be the thing you are. If you're a single player game, be a single player game. If you're a co-op game, be a co-op game. If you're multiplayer, be what multiplayer. if it lends itself well? So like if if the, if then, Play, like back in the day, PlayStation made Killzone and it was a shooter, that multiplayer was fantastic. But that it was a shooter, so it kind of it, it worked with a capture the flag mode and a domination mode because yeah. 
you had grenades, you had shields, you had guns, and you had maps already made for the campaign. So it was an easy produce a spin-off transition. experience, like something like a Ghost of Tsushima yeah. Legends after the fact. Yeah, could do. But who are we to yeah. to tell game developers know. what to do? We just won't buy the games if a they bunch do of talking <laughs> a bunch of talking heads on the internet. Let's talk about Nintendo. So there was Nintendo um, Direct, but it was largely focused on an indie showcase. Mm-hmm. I don't dwell on this too much because, quite frankly, I was a little underwhelmed. Uh, what were your overall thoughts? Yeah, I watched along the live stream, um, and it was pretty much just what I expected from an indie showcase, but I do appreciate how Nintendo tend to cut out a lot of their indie stuff for its own dedicated showcase. I think it highlights the indies a bit more. Yes. But it saves them It saves them getting lost in a bigger one because we always lament the Game Awards and any Jeff Keighley event for like padding out the show with your Honkai Star Rail segment and then there's always an indie segment. But they get lost because they're sandwiched between games that cost a thousand times more to make and you look at them and go, that was cute, but my brain can't remember it because it was made by one guy in a basement and it's pixelated and unless it does something very distinct... It misses out, and the Switch does so well for indie games because it, it can play them, for one, <laughs> because the seven-year-old hardware can run a pixelated 2D side-scroller, no problem. Um, but yeah, there wasn't anything necessary to stand out for me. I thought Morsels looked quite funky. It had a, a good vibe to it. Uh, it was in, from Annapurna. Reminded me of if, if Nidhogg was like a dungeon crawler, if that makes sense. I see what you mean with it. It's almost got the CRT filter over it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, other stuff was shown off. Uh, Pizza Tower as well. I know it did really well on Steam uh, last year, I think it was. Um, it looks like a, a 90s cartoon mixed with Sonic and Mario. Yeah. Like, it, it looks frenetic. Like The fonts look like a, a child made them on Microsoft Paint, and I kind of dig it. I think Never looks quite interesting. It's um, from the developers of Greece. Greece. As well. Go Grease Lightning. Yeah. Well, I, I do agree. I do like how Nintendo give this space to the in, indies without, like, imagine if they chucked a, like, a new Mario game in front of all this. That would be your headlines. Mm. Forever. Like the, yeah. I do like the Indie World Showcase yeah. as a concept, well, even though someone who doesn't kept... play that many indie games. Yeah. I, I know I think this week, I don't know if you saw, they put out like a Zelda Echoes of Wisdom feature showing how like uh zelda that's like the sword or something like that and it, i'm glad they kept that separate they didn't put it yeah. in here because it came out the same week they could have easily just sandwiched some zelda news I in amongst this direct and they didn't I, I i haven't seen that actually i went cold and all zelda echoes of wisdom so i just want to play the game no mm-hmm. I, I, i've already yeah. purchased it I, i'm not interested in any of the marketing you, yeah. you already have my money nintendo um, what else <laughs> yeah we got a yakuza game a PS2 that were had a PS4 port back yeah, in 2017. It's... Kiwami, um, nice to see it coming across again. More more old games being saved on multiple platforms is what we're here for. Yeah. Uh, Tetris Forever got a reveal trailer, which you get to play every Tetris game through the ages, including the Bombless spin-offs. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, Tetris it's is te- awesome. They're all it's largely the, best, the same yeah. though, with different aesthetics, but nah. just the core gameplay of Tetris is. You can't really mess with that too it's much. It's t- timeless, yeah. Um, yeah. And that was about it, really. Like, they showed off a couple... Like, we won't get into it, because the, yeah. there is some, but I think you're right. We've highlighted the ones that things stood out, but we'll talk about them probably just upon their release. Yeah, probably. If, if they do well. It's worth, if you are big on your indie indie games, it's worth just going back and watching the showcase yourself. I think that's the best yeah. advice we can give on, on this. I think it's, as indie, again, as indies go, it's just, I think it's a reasonably solid showing. There's some stuff I don't think necessarily needed to be in there. Like, the Yakuza things, like, it feels like it's just tagged on the end. It, it's an mm-hmm. old game after all, but it needs to go somewhere. Absolutely. Shall we talk about PlayStation Plus, Chris? Because we got, we've got a September lineup. Yes. We do, and talking about it, and talk about Concord, I wonder how much the deal with Warner Brothers and Quidditch champions going into it. So for you Harry Potter fans out there, uh, the brand new game, Harry Potter Quidditch Champions, bear in mind you couldn't play Quidditch in Hogwarts Legacy that came out last year. Quidditch Champions, uh, day one, PlayStation Plus on PS4, PS5. So immerse yourself, Richie, in the so enchanting world of Quidditch. I, I stand by um, Hogwarts Legacy not having Quidditch in. Because I don't think the broomstick mechanics in that game would lend itself to a game like Quidditch. That 
they, that was for them broomsticks were for traversal. You don't think you had the tightness of the controls that you'd need to play mm-hmm. Quidditch. I I'm not sure about Quidditch champions. I have I had no expectations really, for this game at yeah. all. I haven't really I'm, looked into like what it is. Is it games as a service or is it just like online? It, it says on the on the PlayStation blog, live your Quidditch fantasy because we all have them. Take to the skies as one of the classic positions, the chaser, the seeker, the keeper, or the beater, each with their own unique play style, sort into legendary Quidditch arenas and new maps that showcase never-before-seen arenas of the wizarding world. Take on career mode to progress from backyard battles in the Weasley Burrow to high-stakes showdowns at the Quidditch World Cup. Rise to become a champion either solo or in online co-op with teams of up to three friends and launch into exhibition matches where you'll set your teams, map, and difficulty, play alone, or team up to three people online. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably check it out because it's a brand new game that's free. So why not? But in terms of the rest of the list, we've also got MLB The Show 24. We've got Little Nightmares 2, which is great. And of course, you've got maybe like two day. You've got a day. No, you don't have any days. You've got today to claim last month's yeah. games. But yeah, Little Nightmares 2, solid. Um, if you're a bit baseball fan, MLB The Show solid game it's a triple a exclusive title usually to playstation and yeah quiz champions i think it's a solid month i disagree i think this is weak as hell i like little nightmares but if little nightmares 2 is by far the pick of the bunch for me here i'm not this i've got no expectation for quidditch champions and mlb the show why i don't i don't mind sports games being here like Mm -hmm. I benefit myself from um, FIFA 24, um, EA Sports FC 24, sorry, being on PlayStation Plus. But I think by the time it comes, these games drop to something like PlayStation Plus, the season's up pretty much over. It's You get you're excited for the next game. So I think this is, mm. if you're very interested in that game, you've probably already got it. Um, so I, I don't know. I think uh, for me, this is really weak. But then that's why it's subjective, isn't it? Yeah. Like, if you're a huge Harry Potter fan, then a game you might have probably I... played paid £40 for is now free. So that's that's value added straight away. Yeah. I, I... But I agree with you on the sports games. It's like, it's a very neat... If you're not into that sport, it's it's a pretty much a write-off straight away. And like if you are, you probably already got it. So it's... Yeah. It's, it's definitely one of them, I think, that can put out a big name on the catalogue. And it looks cool because it's a big title, but like you said, it's it, it loses value demonstrably month on month sports games. Well, I do think this is a smart move by um, Quidditch Champions actually going day and day to PlayStation Plus. It gives it, it puts itself in a better position to succeed because you're the getting IP. more hands on it. And the IP as well. Like, will more people be playing Quidditch Champions than Concord this week? Yes, I, I think. I, I've, I, I, I think yeah. that's an easy yes. Astronomically, astronomically more. But uh, yeah, and PlayStation Plus. I mean, it's not an overly expensive game. It's twenty four ninety nine on Steam. Oh, from oh, the Deluxe Edition is thirty four ninety nine. I don't. I'm not going to go into what you get in that. We will have to compare Concord and Quidditch numbers next week yeah. to see. Yeah, oh, for the Deluxe Edition, you get a Gryffindor house pack, Hufflepuff house pack, Sliven house pack, Ravenclaw house pack, and 2,000 gold, which I have no context oh. for any of that. So 2,000 gold might be a lot, might be nothing. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I really Gryffindor. don't know. Gryffindor. You know what? It's a, it's, a fairly che- it's a fairly cheap game. I think there's fun to be had. And you know what? Maybe, maybe we should stream it on Thursday. We'll play some Quidditch. If it lines up, yeah. Quidditch. It's PlayStation Plus. Play the rules first. Yeah. You have yeah. to chuck the quaffle at the beta. Let us know. Or something, yeah. Let us know. That sounds like such a bad term. So, this is a very Let's games as a service heavy... Yeah, it's a very um, games as a service heavy show, Chris. Because apparently, live ga- service games got in the way of Crash 5. What are your as, you, as the biggest Crash fan I know, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I'm in two minds about it. So, yeah, we've got a report from Video Game Chronicle that says Crash Bandicoot 5 was in development by Toys for Bob, who made the uh, uh, Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time. Uh, obviously, Toys for Bob no longer owned by Activision. They're now independent because Microsoft let them go, but now they're working with Microsoft on a game, Probably which Spyro. is going to be Spyro for all intents. But everything they've been showcasing has 
had horns on and it's been purple so if they pivot anything other than spyro they're going to piss a lot of people off um but apparently it was cancelled due to activision pulling back funding on single player titles in favor of live service multiplayer titles um no surprise there quite frankly i think before microsoft stepped in to acquire activision it felt like everything was going to feed the call of duty machine vicarious visions who did the crash trilogy they got dismantled and put on call of duty work um, other teams like Beanox and stuff have made great first player, um, single player Spider Man games in the past. They got put onto Call of Duty service. Um, so, Toys for Bob, yeah, no surprise. Um, it feels who like the ones all... who did the Tony Hawk? It was Vicarious. Vicar- Vicar- well? No, it was Vicarious. Was that Vicarious? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, they put out some great games, and yet you got to feed the machine, right? And yeah, but Crash I think... 4 was received very, very well, but seemingly not it, enough for call well, activision numbers it, it was received well it's sold well but call of duty is one of the most profitable it's probably the most profitable video franchise of all time i think sometimes like the directors at activision probably look at the profitability of call of duty as a mm-hmm. benchmark so if it's not a game like crash Road doesn't come close if you look at it in context of games similar you're like you know what that was a really good investment it's got a good social investment as well. It put it put it give Activision a bit of positive news other than just Call of Duty all the time, which is someone who's not elapsed Call of Duty fan. It was nice to see them do something other than Call of Duty. Yeah. But I think it, when they went the cold hard numbers went that is not profitable enough, so we could be more profitable by using these studios elsewhere, and that is a shame because Crash Five now didn't happen because of it. Yeah, could happen now though. I mean, it's one of those. Th- I mean, it's one of those things that now Microsoft are the owners. I think it, it will eventually in time because we've said before, Microsoft and Game Pass need titles that appeal to wider demographics, including family and children. And Crash Bandicoot and Spyro both fit that bill. So I think Toys for Bob are doing a Spyro game. Um, the rumor from this article was the concept art said uh, it was going to be taking place uh, at a school for villainous children and features returning villains from previous games. One uh, supposed concept was Crash teaming up with Spyro following an interdimensional threat to both worlds. Crash and Spyro were intended to be two playable characters. And that could work. It worked on the, there was a Nintendo, I think it was a DS game. Way, way, oh no, it was a Game Boy Advance game back in the day. I remember the cover art. It was Crash and Spyro. They switched colors. So Spyro was in like Orange World and Crash was in Purple World. Um, it was very like loosely connected. But it's interesting how these two mascots almost became synonymous with each other, even though they weren't from the same people or creators. Um, and now they're both owned by Microsoft. It's like, that sounds great. You could have running missions and flying missions with Spyro and spinny attack grounded missions with Crash. They, neither of them really talk, so you've got that like that ability to cross them over, and then you get that ultimate like final boss mission where Crash is riding Spyro and flying on him, and you've got spin slash fire attacks, and it's just the ultimate nineties mascot get a team up. So imagine if like Toys for Bob when they f- finish like um, Crash, Crash Four, they start work, and the did they do the Spyro Re- Reignited trilogy as well? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine when they've done that. So right, next game in the is a spiral game, which the same we're working on now. Imagine mm-hmm. if that ended up like a post credit scene where Spiral gets teleported into oh, Crash's yes. world, and and it's like you get a thing like Crash and Spiral will return, and then that's what Crash Five is, like they just yeah. set it up through the Spiral game. I think we'll see it. I yeah. think we'll see it eventually. It's just going to take more time. Yeah, but they're not going away. They're too big. For, it's like Sonic. You just clearly can't kill them because they're just. They've, they're so long then they are now bona fide classics pop well, culture icons that are just they'll have resurgences every day of the decade for all the, the criticism for all the criticism that xbox seemed to receive phil spencer it seems to be an advocate of listening to what studios passionate about doing and then uh, trying to encourage mm-hmm. trying to encourage them to do that obviously he has to balance it has to be profitable and make sense for xbox as an overall brand but he doesn't seem to be a director who goes, no, you can't do that. You need to do games as a service. If the the studio's gone, we really don't want to do that. But shall we yeah. talk about Lego, Chris? Lego Horizon Adventures. You should also... Apparently the... What? Nothing. Continue. Oh, so, sorry, you, you were breaking up a lot there. Um, Lego... Yeah, it has been... Apologies to anyone who's this five is a bit choppy. It's unfortunate. It seems to be an internet issue. 
Well, LEGO Horizon Adventures is apparently launching the 14th of November and it's apparently been accidentally leaked. Yeah, it was on um, it was on the one of the PlayStation storefront pages. So this happens a lot where someone clearly updates the code too early and it, it shows information with cover art and a little little note to point there. So yeah, I mean, 14th of November. They've been weirdly coy on it and I think that's probably because Nintendo might have like a deal where because it's on the Switch, they get to announce details before PlayStation or something. Like it's part of the agreement. Yeah, it was but a surprise. They've been weirdly coy for a game that's coming out in the next couple of months. It was a surprise inclusion in the Nintendo Direct, wasn't it? Yeah. So, but, 14th of November, though, quite yeah. sooner on the corner. Maybe they don't want to get in the way of Astro about hype because they're both family kid games. Maybe, maybe, maybe that might keep, be PlayStation's quiet and thing. then the next big thing for PlayStation's mm-hmm. Astrobot. Once Astrobot's out the way, then we start pushing Lego Horizons. Yeah. Although it might be because it's a Lego game and not a PlayStation or a Nintendo game, it's down to Lego. Who owns the Lego games? Yeah, Is it the, WB? Uh, yes, it's Warner yeah. Bros. I don't know if they own them, they've just got the, like, the publishing the deal with them because yeah. it's TT Games, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's. So this isn't TT Games. Uh, whoever's publishing this game then. Um, the marketing might be on them rather than Nintendo or Sony to do this. Absolutely. But looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> I am. I think as long as if I'm wrapped up with Outlaws, I'm wrapped up with Astrobot. Indiana Jones doesn't come out to December, so if I'm kind of in the mood for something around then, it's I, I love the Horizon series. I love the Lego games. So it's again, it's perfect. And it's it's two players. So it's probably something that if, if the wife's in, interested, yeah, why not? I think I might pick this up, um, actually. I think me and my girlfriend would enjoy playing through it together. It'd be, I think it'd be a good one for that, because we're both like Horizon, we're both like Lego, so... Tick, tick. Tick, tick, indeed. Another tick, tick. Remedy and Anna Perna team up for Control 2 and Alan Wake TV stroke movie adaptations. I think a Control movie would be absolutely amazing. Hello. Yep. I I hear choppy bits. I know what you're saying. It's uh, Discord's just having a shit show today, apparently. Where I think you're yeah. freezing for me and I'm freezing for you, so we're we're caught in and amongst. I'm catching like the start of sentences and the end of sentences. So we have the show notes to thankfully see yeah. us through. Yeah, remedy and and a pair. Yeah, uh, um, control. It's an interesting one. I think <sighs> Control probably works more from a TV movie standpoint than than Alan Wake. I think Alan Wake could tell a really cool horror story slash TV show. Um, Anna Perna stepping in for like publishing rights, I think, is Remedy just saying, like, look, we need some extra financial assistance and get this off the ground. We know Remedy run very close to the ground. I don't think Alan Wake 2 has actually been profitable for them yet. Which I'm is surprised by that because it was really well it's, received. It's it's one of them weird video game things, isn't it, where we know they, they, we know they make the games for a little bit less than most. I think Control only costs like 200 million or something as opposed to the 300, 400 that you'd expect from the quality of game we got out of it. And same with Alan Wake 2. For, for the polish we got, it, it doesn't cost as much. So... Remedy run quite a tight ship, they seem to have done, and they're fully in full production on Control 2 now. So I think getting another publisher on board to maybe help finance some of it is is a win for all parties there. Anna Perna have got a proven track record as well, as do Control. But the yeah, the, the film, TV, and other audiovisual formats being part of the deal is an interesting one. I could see this universe being shipped out to, to TV, especially because these games are so heavily live action anyway. Like with the cutscenes and you could even use the same actors, and they already know the role and they already know the story. So, it it's interesting. I I still think, unfortunately, as much as I love Alan Wake, it's is the name Alan Wake. If you're yeah. going to make a TV adaptation, it needs a a more I, catchy name to get people in well, from I think a marketing standpoint. With Alan Wake and Control being set in the same universe, I think you focus around Control a bit more, and Alan yeah. Wake could be an author, and maybe a consultant. Mm-hmm. To what's what's the name of the organization in Control called? It's the F, not FBI, um, Federal, Federal Bu- FBC, FBC yeah. Federal Bureau of Control. You could see someone like Alan Wake consulting on that, and that's how you bring him into it. 
Mm -hmm. okay yes how you can get him in it in and out of it without him actually being the central focus of it you could just do control story and then season two you'll leave season one with a teaser for alan wake coming into it and then he's like the villain slash good guy maybe of season two and maybe imagine imagine if at the end you set like the whole first season set around central the federal bureau of control and the whatever the house is called i can't remember the name of it the the oldest house the oldest house set around that and at the end is like okay imagine the end of like an episode or even the series going oh we need to go to what was it called the the little village some nightmare springs or something what was it called? Night Springs. Night, Night Springs. Springs. Yeah, we're, oh, we're going to need to go to Night Springs and like all the Alan Wake fans go, oh, they're going there. <laughs> Shit, it's happening. It's yeah. happening, people. Yeah, I think it could be good. But then it's weird controlling Alan Wake, I think, in a way. They could almost get away with a TV show and I don't think a lot of the general public would have a clue it was linked to a video game. No. They would just see it as like this cool horror drama with a lot of I, trippiness in it. I'm feeling like Stranger Things vibes from Control. Yeah. That's how you could kind of... If you like Mark Stranger Things, you'd love this. Kind yeah, of thing. absolutely. Um, and Netflix will have that that gap to fill next year because Stranger Things is finished as well. So we'll see who picks it up. I think whoever picks it up will, will be a telling sign of what to expect. Yeah, my only issue with Netflix picking stuff up is very very rare does Netflix shows like last more than one or two seasons. Yeah, which is a shame because with these IP being quite strong and ripe for exploring even further and i think they'll end themselves both quite well to like a tv show format it just it'd be shit hopefully they can get something decent going yeah i agree i agree croc legend of the gobbles chris it's back is it gobbles or gobbles what do what do you say i'd say gobbles yeah, I think I said Gobos, but... Gobos. 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 The legend of Gobos. Um, he's coming back, Richie. He is. Uh, I know I know. I had a big campaign for Save the Gecko, and Gex is coming back with the Gex trilogy. Save the Bandicoot happened. Like, that was a whole thing, and we've got Spyro. I, I don't really have much affinity for Croc. I remember playing it at my neighbor's house and thought, oh, cool, it's a crocodile, and he jumps on crates and over little rivers, and he fights these... I can't remember what the villains, the like creatures were like you jumped on and stomped on. I think they were like lizards, maybe or something, little, like well, bug creatures. But either way, it's a 1997's multi sell multi million selling hit croc, uh, the lovable crocodile who embarks on a quest to rescue the gobos from the clutches of the evil Baron Dante. Is there uh, coming back in a, a remake, remake, reboot to all current consoles and PC? Uh, it says in 2024, which doesn't leave them long. But, no, uh, um, but Argonaut Games is back as well. The the original developer, they were, they closed down in two, um, two thousand four. It's nice to see them back. It's interesting that they're back and they're putting out a game this year, like so quickly. Like you think they'd be announced their return well, and then go, oh, and the first title we're working on coming next year, maybe. We should point out as well, it's not a remake; it's a remaster. True. So the the amount of work involved is significantly reduced. It's basically getting this game running at 1080p on modern hardware. That's kind of the job here. Hmm. But, One of the cool things with this remaster, though, as they have said um, for retro fans, is the remaster is going to include Crocopedia, an extensive and meticulously curated digital museum containing long-lost development assets such as game design documents, concept art, animation tests, team member interviews, and much, much more. For, so for video game preservation, that's, that's cool. super cool. Yeah. Um, I'd probably check out Croc, actually, because, again, I didn't play it as much because I didn't own it. It was just whenever I happened to be at my neighbor's house. But it is essentially just 3D Mario, 3D Crash and stuff type well, levels. it started off as a Yoshi game. Uh, I think Argonaut pitched it as a Yoshi game to Nintendo and it got rejected, so they had to change. That's why Croc yeah. exists. It's like because they had this model of Yoshi. It's like, how do you adapt him? Crocodile. Yeah. That a could cro- work. That's cool. I like that. What does Yoshi do? Yoshi do? Is that yeah. him? Wah, 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 wah. Like, yeah, something like that. <laughs> something like that. But I wonder if it still have its tank controls. Oh, did it have tank controls? It I did. don't remember that. It did. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, this, I hope they offer an alternative. This is where you do need an alternative. You need to keep the original, traditional, and modern controls. That's what you need in the settings here. Yeah. Oh yeah, I won't be enjoying it if it's got tank control still. No. So we're actually continuing on, Chris. Um, 
we've got some Luna news. Um, there's Do new we? games. There's new games coming to Amazon Luna, and Goodens as well. Star Wars Outlaws. Star Wars Outlaws is coming to Amazon Luna, nice. and so has Middle Earth Shadow of War. So we've talked a lot about Star Wars Outlaws in the show. It's nice we to have. see Ubisoft continue to support Luna. I don't really think we need to talk much more about that. No, I don't think we need... Uh, Shadow of War's been out for a while. I think it's just the, the news is it's gone free for Amazon Prime members because of the launch of Rings of Power Season 2. Oh, so God, it's, it's been there a while. We just we just haven't picked it up. I know there's it's a three-episode uh, launch for Season 2 as well, so there's three episodes to go watch already. Yeah. Um, I'll probably watch them tonight, actually. But, uh, yeah, Shadow of War, great game. Um, the sequel, annoyingly, so you're not getting Shadow of Mordor on Luna uh, for free, but it's a nice tie-in, and, and Shadow of War is a phenomenal game. Um, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you should definitely check out Mordor first, but War does a does a really good job at upping the I ante. I still haven't played and it. should go play it on Luna. Check I'll out how it performs. It's, it's installed. Prime member? No. I rarely am. Um, I'm, I usually, I'll activate Amazon Prime when I need it. I don't like to have just this rolling subscription for just Amazon in general. Um, but I already I have Shadow of War on PlayStation. It's been installed on my PS5 since I have my PS5. I've just never, as did Shadow of Tomb Raider. <laughs> so eventually it's just I'll lots get to of it. Shadows. You yeah. need to install Assassin's Creed Shadows at the end of the month, uh, the end of the year. <laughs> have an and entire dashboard the of tri- Shadows. The, tri- the trilogy of Shadows, yeah. Shadow of the Tri- Colossus. I have that anymore. Uh, Elden Ring, Shadow of the Air Tree. I've got, I've got Elden Ring on Xbox. I've got Elden Ring on Xbox. Metal Gear Shadow Moses. A <laughs> stretch, but I'm pulling them out of my ass here, folks. <laughs> yeah, I think Shadow of War was, I think, one that was... It unfortunately got stuck in the huge loot box controversy that was happening at the time it came out, and it just it got did. pulled into that, and I think that harmed it, which is probably why we never got a third game. <sighs> but we're getting a Wonder Woman game. Are we? Na, 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 na. Are we I mean, actually getting have it? been working on it. Monolith have been on it for like four or five years now, so I hope so. Yeah, I've never seen anything about it other than that that one CGI trailer of I think um, Wonder Woman. I think with her arms crossed. So I can't remember. I don't even know if they've teased it. We had a teaser that trailer, and that's it. Yeah. We've just oh, we're making a Wonder Woman game, and then we've had nothing in about four years. It must be in line for this year. I don't think WB have it anything. Can, it can't be this year. Lined I, up to that. All, all, all the Batman ones are done. It'd be weird. Oh no! To sorry, not this year. year. No, next yeah. year. I don't know why. I, I forget how close we are to the end of the year. Yeah, I was going to say, which, like, is, which is mad. Yeah, we're in sorry, September yeah, next, and there's no year. big market beats before like Christmas. Game enough. Awards. Yeah, it's at the Game Awards. The big reveal, the full reveal, is at the Game Awards coming yeah. later, 2025. Because yeah, WB have nothing, right? Hogwarts Legacy's done. The two Batman shit shows are out and done. There's they've got them. Can be another injustice. They have Mortal Kombat out. Yeah. But other than that, I don't think WB Multiversus has done. They, they don't have a Lego game out this year or next year. So WB very quite. I mean, they are looking to sell off some of their assets and stuff, remember? Again. So, they, again, they, yeah, interesting. They're very times. fickle without um, wanting to sell them, not wanting to sell them, wanting to sell them, not wanting to sell. Yeah. Odd one. But time will tell. Yeah. You know what time will also tell, Chris? PlayStation FC with fake football kits in Japan. I, I, the black and white and as a fan of Newcastle United I don't mind a black and white kit they should be blue in this PlayStation yeah, is blue bit, yeah for for those who don't know there's yeah there's a Japanese streetwear brand called Sof or Sopa I don't know how to say it um, and they made it they've made an imaginary football team called FC Real Bristol <laughs> which is like Bristol I, I don't know where they've pulled that from uh and it's basically a way to flog some pricey clothes that look like football attire like jerseys and jackets and training gear um none of it appeals to me you're no, talking 100 no. 100 upwards dollars to ship to the uk as well um there are rumors of some nike playstation collaborations coming next year but i know i'm not much of a shoe it, trainer person anyway so to be fair this um the push square article we're reading from has said that a lot of the um, $180 shares have already sold out. Wow. I suspect, though, this could be a case of a lot of marketing will keep the amount of actually supply low so they can then yeah. say, oh, it's sold out, so we have to do another run. Oh, that artificial, so to create yeah. artificial demand. Yeah, some of it looks so bad. Um, 
I mean, I'm not really into the baggy stuff anyway, but why? Uh, the, I'd be curious Real to know Bristol. why is it Bristol? I really FC don't get it. Like, they Real have Bristol. Yeah, they have shirt like they have T-shirts that say FC RB on the front, and it's like I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, understand, like but people are buying it. I mean, in Japan, it like Bristol might mean something. Like, no offense to anyone who lives down in Bristol, it's it's a they lovely part a of the country. Bristol Rovers, but, yeah, they do. And Real is, there another is one? Real is Bristol Spanish Rovers, for Royal, so it doesn't even make sense. So that it's the translation of Real Madrid will be Royal Madrid. <laughs> like, there's Bristol City as well, right? Yeah, I think so. They're, they're the better of the two, I think. I can't remember. I just remember Bristol Rovers. Well, at the weekend, they got beat by Derby County 3-0. Just saying. Yeah. Well, there you go. Bristol Rovers and won 2-0 against Cambridge. There you go. Yeah. They are in the league low. But uh, random football talk at the end because of PlayStation. Yeah. yeah. Give me some... Give me You know what? Give me some more simplified match. Like, I'm a big fan of just a plain T-shirt... With just a, I mean, look, like the Disney one, simple you logo, the yeah, Disney like just give me a PlayStation logo on a black or plain colored T-shirt. Don't give me like a massive spread across the back or something. Just keep it simple, folks. Keep it simple. Yeah, I, I'm like that because I think sometimes if it's too much, I don't feel comfortable wearing it in public. Mm. I, I, I'd rather yeah, something. Um, I'd rather subtlety. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we go, as a total sign note, I meant to mention this when I got back from France. Keep talking about soul. I bought some Tic Tacs in France. Okay. And this is a very random segue for the end of an episode. But if you've been tactics. here for an hour and <laughs> you've been here for an hour and a half. No, no, the the flavour of them. Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. Please. Chlorophyll. And they do not taste like the stuff you put into a swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, that's cost- like chlorophyll but- is the green is what makes um plants yeah. photosynthesize. Oh yeah, not not the stuff. What do they put in pools then? Chlorine. Chlor- chlorine, oh yeah, not chlorophyll. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. yeah. Apparently you can make Tic Tacs out of it as well. Indeed. Um, but that's all we have time for the news. Um, let's end the show with, as we always do, with this week in video game history. And Chris, I'm going to say 10 straight back to August the 31st. So we're recording this on the 1st, but it's worth going back a day. Go back a day, let's see. Uh, I mean, September the 1st, Rayman. <laughs> Came yeah, out on the Rayman Jag- pales in Jaguar comparison to something in uh, August the 31st. August the 31st. Die Hard Trilogy. And above it on the list? Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> I can't believe you missed years Crash. Ago. No, I didn't. Actually, you know what? It's a great... August 31st is great. Look at the list. Is, yeah. Crash Bandicoot, 28 years ago, 1996. Uh, the Die Hard Trilogy, I absolutely adored on PlayStation. I had the light gun. So the first level was I... the light gun. The second level was a third person platformer in nakatomi plaza and the third um game as part of it was the driving game like crazy yeah. taxi because all, the all arcade games started great um i loved it uh, the lost world jurassic park for playstation one playing as the raptor playing as alan grand playing as the t-rex that or the compi as well that was got 27 years ago damn and the cheats yeah. still work Mega Man legends dino crisis 25 years ago um, I think the 31st of August might be the best day we've ever had on this It's definitely up there. List. Life is Strange Before the Storm, seven years ago. Life is Strange, I, I'll, I'll take that one as well. It's consistently, over the decades, a good day to bring up video games. It is, absolutely. Um, Mega Man... Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Dynasty Warriors 4, Empires. Or Dynasty Warriors, yeah. however you want to say it. Yeah, I like it, I like it. Um, on this day, did anything actually come out on the 1st of September then? Rayman obviously just threw away. Doesn't matter. Rayman. Yeah, um, Ma- Mad Max and oh. Metal Gear Solid Five, The Phantom Pain. Both of them I've got on when I bought as a bundle when I bought my PlayStation Four. Right. That was the bundle um, I got. Mad Max and Metal Gear Solid, and I bought FIFA as well. Mad Max very underrated by WB. I, I agree. Should have stuck with it. Should have stuck with it. Was it was a good game. Um, and I remember Metal Gear Solid because I got it on my birthday nine years ago when I moved into this house. And if you at the start of the game, it asks you to put your date of birth in. And when you arrive back at the oil rig home base, they all celebrate. The dog runs out. There's fireworks. And it's like, happy birthday, Snake. It, but it's my birthday in real life. And it was quite strange. I remember sitting on my living room floor. We had no furniture yet. Playing that. I think my wife was ironing. And I was just there. Didn't care like, when you're like, oh, look how amazing it is. <laughs> it's like the game's saying happy birthday to me. Like how weird and surreal Kojima is. Um, and... 
Uh, also, one year ago, PC and Xbox, Starfield. Yeah. One year ago already. Damn. And Marvel's Avengers. You mentioned it earlier in the show. Four years ago since Marvel's Avengers graced our screens. I but, stand uh, by yeah. to this day. If you can get a very cheap, it's worth playing for the single player. I, I agree. I yeah. agree. So yeah, uh, yeah. The August September transition oh. is uh, oh. is a good time to be alive. There's one more I want to pick up on from um, s- tomorrow, so September the second, and The Sims Four ten years ago. We need well, Sims Five. Well, we it's do. Ti- it's uh, time. There's, a, there's a rumor of it being like a free to play, isn't it? The next Sims will be like just a platform. Which that, I think The Sims 4 has been for 10 years now, but I think just embrace that it, The Sims could be free yeah. and you can charge this shit out well, of it for just cosmetics and <laughs> everything else. The Sims is arguably the reason microtransactions exist because but all the way back in The Sims 1, they yeah. made so many DLC. It wasn't even DLC. You had to go to a shop and buy a separate disc. A disc yeah. yeah, and that's and I, I, always been part of The Sims. Yeah, and I distinctly remember buying The Sims Vacation from Electronics Boutique I actually remember that. 98 and 99. Um, got it home, put it in the PC, didn't have the base game. And as a daft kid, I just thought there was a copy of The Sims that was shit cheap at 19.99, as opposed to paying 40 or 50 or whatever the base game was. Got my mum and dad to buy it, got home, was like, oh damn, I don't have the original game. And you couldn't return PC games, I don't think, because of the copy, you could copy the, burn the disc. So I was yeah, stuck with just it. Yeah, just wouldn't let you. Until I got a base copy of The Sims. Great game of Sims. Seminal. I'd like to see a Sims 5. Yeah. I think we will. There must be well, the Sims like world ten, or the Sims years. universe or what is it? It's been rumoured, I think. We just haven't had anything concrete. Oh, no, I've, I've, I think they've actually openly spoke about it, but that's for another week. And, yeah. But that's us for this week. If you've liked the video, make sure you like the hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and ring that bell so you kept in the all oh, fantastic content here at Game Guild TV. We might be playing a bit of Hogwarts on Thursday. We don't know yet. Let us know in the comments of this video or on our Discord server. Links in the description below if you'd like to join in. Thank you very much for watching. My name's been Richie. I've been Chris. Goodbye, everyone. GG. Bye. Bye.